Okay, so uh, now uh, our guests are sitting in front of you and uh, I'm asking you to ask the questions concerning the session in which we are trying to figure out what should be the processes triggering the proper integration of science into industry, the proper uh, collaboration within those two groups of the society. We've learned a lot about the culture of, uh, I would say, new science, the way our colleagues see it, and I would be very grateful for coming concepts from... Well, first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to share a few thoughts with you. Um, I think that from my experience in industry, um, and I have to admit, first of all, um, embarrassingly, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a molecular biologist. My background is actually in uh, computational genome analysis for the past nearly 30 years, uh, but then also in um, large-scale data analysis, semantic data integration. Um, I think, first of all, um, based on the uh, presentations uh, we heard in this session, I think it's great to see that um, there are initiatives that uh, aim to familiarize uh, people with the latest uh, technologies, the latest methods, provide them with a very solid statistical uh, background, and at the same time uh, ensure that the creativity uh, remains there. That's very important and that it's actually huge fun. Having said that, um, what would help us a lot in, in industry is to provide this uh, link to, I don't like using this expression, to, to the real world as it were. It doesn't mean that in uh, academic science it's not the real world, but there are certain uh, constraints that we are facing in, uh, in industry. And it, for example, the concept of ISO standards when it comes to uh, qu data quality management, uh, data security, um, the concept of intellectual property, uh, both in in the context of software development, but also as linked to applications in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, swap, okay. Is it better? Okay, thank you. Also, um, how to manage a project, to set uh, milestones in a, in a team, uh, the concept of costing a project. Software development is not free. In, in an industrial environment. You need to, to calculate a budget, uh, you need to uh, provide a quote to, to a client, you need to make decisions on whether you are going to develop something according to the feedback you get from the users, and, and so on. So the, this is just um, you know, a bird's eye view, but I think what would help, so how do we get there? I think it, it would help if we, uh, find a, a way to integrate um, industry uh, input. For example, get more uh, lectures from industry in, in the courses with real life case studies from their projects. What are the challenges? How do you address them in a team? And Perhaps also the, the concept of a sandwich course with a one year or six months placement in an industrial project. I noticed this, for example, with, uh, from uh, an example in my own family. My, my stepson just completed a sandwich course in mechanical engineering. Uh, three years undergraduate, one year uh, in industry, followed by a master's. And it helped him enormously. He was thrown at the deep end, but all these concepts that I mentioned earlier uh, were on the table, and he had to deal with them with great help from his colleagues. So anyway, a long answer. Um, th these are my thoughts, and I would really like to uh, hear also your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Uh, I do not know, Dmitri, do you have anything to add or? <laughs> 
What would be your expectations as a founder of the company? Expectations? Concerning uh, alumni who are graduating from a uh, good university and you would like, you would like for instance, to, to get those people working with you. What kind of skills you would expect from them? Uh, well, uh, I think first of all, uh, the, the, skill, the skills is one thing. I think, uh, I think enthusiasm and uh, excitement about uh, I think there is among more I, uh, academicians, I think there is, at least in some pop subpopulations, there is kind of a misconception that if you're idealistic and you want to pursue science, you need to be an academia, and if you want to kind of get down to the real world, support your family, then you go to the industry. But, but uh, there, there are just different as aspects, and you can pursue uh, noble, uh, goals to just work a little bit differently. I think working in a company, it's more of a team goal setting rather than individual. Um, I know working with the PI and working uh, working on a, so it's a, it's a slightly different mindset and so uh, uh, projects move faster in the sense of um, you have many more um, people working on the same. Um, it, it's, it's very, um, uh, common in, in academia to be working for five years on something, in, and uh, it, 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 projects are much more fa fast-paced and there is a lot more communication. So I think one of the main things is, is to bring th that enthusiasm for science and for accomplishing something, for improving the world, and, and turn that into a product and then into an idea. That's, that's, that's what I, I would be looking for in, in people who are coming um, yeah. to work for a company. Uh, thank you. Uh, don't you think that uh, what we are discussing now, in a sense, that would uh, show that uh, we should, I, I'm talking now about teachers, yeah, academicians, we should start it much, much earlier than we used to, because our contacts are usually starting at the level of the master studies of our students. Then sometimes we have some common projects if we have the contacts with outside companies. I'd, I'd go so far as to yeah. say that even undergraduate level that perhaps science-related science courses have modules that are business management focused as well, yes. just to at least give people an understanding and a flavour of the sorts of things that businesses are looking for in terms of... Uh, things to think about, costing, budgets, those sorts of things, but also managing people, HR, um, and those those more kind of business management skills, I think would be possibly quite a useful starting point. That's what, uh, why I was addressing also something what was uh, projected in Buildstock, namely, in a sense, what we are observing nowadays that we are facing a totally new culture of building up contacts between academia and uh, industry, whether we call it industry or economy, mm -hmm. economic environment, it doesn't matter, but uh, that should be something totally different. And you, you're telling us about, for instance, intellectual property. Uh, well, I think that uh, the day someone is bringing me the data from the company, let it be a bank as a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we would be happy to analyze those data. Not all of them would be uh, the data which can be shared with us. Yeah? The question is to what extent you see this type of processes also are going on in companies? Do people are aware of the fact that right at the corner it might be a group of young uh, students who would be willing to, to see how to analyze <laughs> I think there's a perception by industry that universities are more interested in what they can get out of the data and what they can secure in terms of IP mm -hmm. and, and, and um, kudos for themselves. And I think, and whilst that may or may not be the case, and some universities are stronger at it and more and hold on to these things more vehemently than others, I do think that sometimes businesses can think that that's, well, we need to hold on to the data ourselves and we're not ready to collaborate in that. In, in that way. Um, there's an example quite recently where I've been look, investigating costing a, a clinical trial for, for a client and um, potentially going through a university and the first question the university said to me was, what about co-authoring? Who owns the data? Can we publish? And that's not always necessarily what the, the, industry, side, yes. yeah, the in, industry want to hear. 
Yeah, thank you. This is a very good remark. Also, especially in the, in the, since we are talking about neuroscience, um, another interesting aspect which uh, often talking to students I, I feel uh, is uh, th th that there is a gap in, in the knowledge is the fact that um, if you're working in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry or in the uh, diagnostic therapeutic te technology, medical technologies industry, you also have additional constraints from uh, regulatory authorities. And especially the fact that uh, software can be a medical device, uh, this is very important. Something like, so this, I just mentioned it as another concept which I think uh, will be increasingly uh, common in the future. So this interface of technology, software, and directly then the application with, with the patient at the end. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of mileage there in, in terms of case studies, in terms of raising the awareness and building excellent teaching examples in, in this area. And that's something that certainly uh, the industry sectors I mentioned would uh, greatly appreciate. Yes, so, Daniel. So I think we should get the voice to, to the... Ah, you are, you're the first. Yes, I was the first. Sorry, I just... Okay. Sure. <laughs> go on. All right, um, this, this will just go out to the speakers. Uh, my name is Dr. Bandrovsky. Um, I wear many hats, uh, both industry and uh, academic. So um, the question, though, that I wanted to ask, and I appreciated you talking about the um, standards, and I appreciated you guys talking about data. That's fantastic. What about standard databases? What about the curation of those? Because I did not hear the word curation come out of any of your talk. Maybe I missed it. I, I could have, you know, uh, glossed over it for a second, but it certainly is not part of any of the curricula that I'm, I'm aware of. And this is a very uh, fast-growing field. Very few standards exist in it. Now there's some uh, you know, data curators around geno genomics. But um, outside of genomics, it's, it's, a, it's a wasteland. There's, there's nothing out there. And there's just people kind of uh, in the Wild West doing things without standards. So um, I wonder if you guys can address, uh, think about, um, you know, what are the core databases out there for, you know, if you're going to talk about data, well, you're going to have to talk about databases. It's not just data. And then the questions are, well, how do you get that data to be aligned? Because we know that aligned data is actually useful. Non-aligned data is just a large pile of work. Um, so I, I wonder if you could take that on. Think about standards, curation, data alignment as part of uh, any curriculum in neuroinformatics. I can, I can maybe answer how we, we do that in, in the context of neuroacademy, because I agree with you that those things are very important. Uh, specifically, that, that community is focused on human neuroscience and particularly on MRI data, and so we teach about BIDS. And we, we had uh, Chris Gorgolewski uh, come for a brief visit from back from, indust from his uh, uh, time in industry to talk about bids and, and present that to, to those individuals. And part of the activities they did during the hackathon is take some data sets from their own research and convert them into the, the bid standard. And I think we, we make an effort to explain why that is a useful thing to do. Um, so. Say that again. Okay. Um, so one of the big projects that was funded um, and might might exist here uh, is uh, Spark, and we had adapted bids to that particular project because bids only covers neuroimaging so far, and it has a lot of other data types. So it it will be very interesting. We have not yet let the community know about that. Um, right. I, I think an important point. Thing to a point to make about the difference between industry and and academia is that for many of the experiments that people do, they're, they're, it's too it's premature to start standardizing, right? Because then you leave no room for creativity and creating new kinds of data and so on. So it's, that's always a danger as well. But I agree with you that those kinds of things are good to start formalizing. From the back. 
So, so I have just one comment and, uh, and one question. I like very much your observation about the sandwich courses in neuroinformatics. So, you know, I, I'm aware that a number of uh, neuroinformatics students here actually have jobs in industry, and I've always been thinking about this as sort of detrimental. But I've realized that it's just the opposite. It's actually an opportunity, and perhaps it would be an idea just to sort of formalize it and just get, uh, you know, collaboration actually with some industrial partners. Uh, yeah. My daughter actually has just entered the chemical technology sandwich course. She's starting this year, so I'm very curious how it's going to work. You know, when I was a kid, we had no things like that, so... Never my, my, my colleagues who, who teach computer science expect their graduate students to be gone about three months a year during the summer yeah. because they go off and do internships in industry, very yeah. well-paid in internships in industry, so they can make up for the fact that they're right, not right, being but, paid but, but, as much the rest of the year. I think it would be great if neuroscientists were expected to go and do inter right. internships. But I mean, I've just realized that you could actually formalize and sort of try to make ties with sort of meaningful industries just to actually, you know, make this a part of the curriculum. But the question I have is, you know, when I was, looking, when I was listening to Yarek and, and, and Bill, you know, both of you saying in, in a way very similar things, but from two different perspectives of uh, physicists and biologists, and I was... Uh, wondering, you know, if, if there is a way to actually have a joint curriculum which would appeal, you know, to both the disciplines, like, you know, something that, you know, you have biologists and physicists sort of coming together and then, you know, maybe ending up as, as those different bees that Bill presented us, but... Or do we really have to think that, you know, we really need to put those curricula in different departments so that you have, you know, sort of neuroinformatics for the biologists and neuroinformatics for the physicists, neuroinformatics for the computer scientists, I don't know. What do you think? Right, right. I would certainly hope that it doesn't get that splintered. My dream is that eventually universities will turn to what they once were when they didn't have departments, because so many of us work across departments, but the money flow isn't, at this point, it's uh, orthogonal to that. Uh, so. That's my take. I hope we wouldn't do that. I hope you could have like many courses here, or there, and it'd be part of a grander curriculum. Well, that, that's what I said. That uh, the, especially at the second cycle, we have the opportunity for the students to mingle between different, so we can compose a curriculum that is suitable for a given student, if he's. Uh, even, even if, if he's, uh, he finished the, the first cycle here, um, but he's interested more in biology, he just takes courses nearby the biology department. So how many people from biology do you have coming for the master's here? Uh, not that much, I would say. From biology, in fact, I think I haven't had any. I have, uh, we have from uh, neurocognitive, neurocognitivistic studies. It's fear of math, perhaps. Yes, they are probably <laughs> afraid of math. <laughs> okay. But... Uh, I, mean, is it, I mean, is it something that when students come into the department for the first time, they're, they're, those links between the different disciplines aren't obvious to them? I know that from a neuroscience point of view and an engineering, a mechanical engineering point of view or an electrical engineering point of view, those two connections aren't necessarily obvious. But yet, when you sit an engineer was down with a neuroscientist, massively brilliant things can happen. Um, so it's, you know, how do we kind of get those guys talking right when they first really start getting interested and start studying this properly for the first time? I think, thank you. Um, apart from the sandwich course, which of course is a major commitment, at that point you need to have made up your mind that this is what you would like to do. Um, perhaps um, you can have a rotation between departments. So uh, interested uh, engineering students can sign up uh, for a few uh, presentations or lectures in neuroscience and, and vice versa. And uh, they will probably, I would imagine that quite a few of them will discover that, hey, this is interesting. This is actually what I would like to do and find out more about it. I certainly experienced that in, in genomics uh, when the field was very young uh, in, in the 80s with uh, DNA sequencing still very expensive and slow. And people started coming into bioinformatics from physics, from mathematics, from engineering, from astrophysics even. 
And they had to learn the uh, biological concepts, but they were so fascinated and they, they loved the field so much. And uh, many of uh, these colleagues made enormous contributions to the field. They brought a completely different angle. So, and I think that would uh, be perhaps an interesting option to, to consider on the teaching level. Yes, thank you. And we have uh, some voices from the back. I was, I was just wondering if there is um, uh, some experience of uh, industry uh, uh, personal people going and actually giving part of some courses in universities and, uh, and at least uh, uh, you know in some aspect of a, of a technique or uh, and then you know of, of course there's, there's a potential conflict of interest to be careful of, uh, but you know at, 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 you know it would be I, mean, I was just uh, wondering whether there, there's some experience of that. Uh. Well certainly in the area of uh, drug discovery, um, I have seen that in, uh, in London at Birkbeck College where um, I used to teach, um, we had um, scientists coming in from uh, big pharmas explaining, uh, giving lectures on drug discovery, the challenges, what is uh, a target validation, how does a clinical trial work, and so on. So, and that certainly uh, works very well. So there's no reason why uh, we couldn't do the same in uh, computational neuroscience. Just, just wanted to add to that, Brainbox Initiative are running a computational neuroscience course um, in, Switzerland, uh, in Lyon at some point later on this year or next year. So there are, the, the Brainbox Initiative is um, sort of a program of activities designed to kind of um, promote um, early researchers' work and actually get, give them hands-on time and experience with, with equipment that they may not otherwise be exposed to. Um, and we've teamed up with um, one of the universities down um, near Lyon for a neuroinformatics course. So if anybody's interested, then go to the website. <laughs> Sorry, little plug there. Yeah. One of the things which I can add as, um, as an experience uh, brought up by our students in my university is... Um, something what was really thought up by them, the full initiative coming from them, and we were only uh, helpers, <laughs> assistants. Uh, so the idea was to uh, organize some sort of workshops for the uh, spin-off companies, which are already registered, which are young, and some of them maybe will survive, some of them will die. But they were, I mean, both companies were seeking for particular uh, people with uh, skills, let's say, in the Bayesian uh, analysis, or uh, people who were able to um, understand the time series analysis and model those. Uh, we have three conferences in the row, year by year, organized by students of the uh, master degrees. They invited those younger colleagues from the environment, and the presentation was made as a sort of a discussion. So it was mostly the people who were from both startups coming with the problem and showing the problem and trying to figure out to what extent uh, the audience is responsive to their problems, whether they are uh, building up any kind of relation. And I think this is really something what, uh, at least at the level of the university, to us, to teachers who are sometimes unaware of those newest uh, achievements in uh, solving problems in different companies, this is really fantastic uh, way of solving those problems because uh, at the end of the day, there, there are some people who would be able to work together and maybe they will meet and it would be done spontaneously, not by us. The other thing is, of course, that we can do it by, uh, let's say, more legal uh, actions, like, for instance, um, signing up the agreement yeah, with one of the banks and saying that we would be uh, giving the courses for the people from, from the bank and we expect that someone from the bank will come and give a course in short, short course in economy and we will work at that level. But of course this requires totally different actions. So my idea was just to ask you what kind of uh, interaction is uh, valuable from the point of view of people who are working really in industry. Well, it's 
a broad topic. I think um, we certainly, when I say we, certainly the industry definitely would uh, love to get more involved. Uh, I've heard from so many colleagues that they are very keen to uh, get involved in, in teaching, in presentations, in bridging this, this gap, because clearly it is in the interest of the, of the industry in the long term. But at the same time, uh, I think it would help in order to, to break down the uh, perceived barrier. Uh, because essentially, as you mentioned, it's, it's all about having a great idea and to, having the fun of uh, creating something, something really nice. Um, so, there are many models. I mean, it can be uh, placements, it can be presentations, it can be uh, joint projects. Uh, I think one needs to explore a little bit what uh, the interests are in the various uh, sectors. But um, I think the, uh, certainly the, um, the willingness and the, um, uh, uh, the desire to do that is, is there on the industrial side. You mentioned the, the banks, for example. I think uh, it, since we are talking about computational applications, it's not only about the concepts of economics, but specifically in this area, um, fintech software development. What are the constraints? What are the real life stories, the challenges? Uh, and again, yeah, we can of, yeah. transfer this to neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, please. There, there, there was also the question from the back. I'm sorry. <coughs> it was. It's mine. Is not actually a big question. I, I'm um, going to try answer to one of the previous questions on the need for curation and standards mm -hmm. and teaching. I think she was referring to that. So there is actually a lot of growing activity in this area, especially uh, when you think of curation as quality control. Mm -hmm. INCF, we started a special interest group in this aspect. and We are running a um, lot of courses at various conferences, and a webinar series is also coming. The problem there is that people are aware of the issues. There are just not enough resources to actually uh, push that through and make it happen, right? So these are all many side projects to many PIs, but to make it happen, we need to throw more resources towards that. Thank you. Thank you. The comment? Or <laughs> because I'm, I'm sorry, there was also one question which we have not addressed so far. Yeah, thanks so much for um, a really interesting day. I'm still thinking about uh, Carol's talk earlier and one of her stories had a big bad wolf of the senior investigator being one of the barriers and particularly around incentives. So who's working on trainings for senior faculty? <laughs> You're asking in general? I mean... Just them. <laughs> it seems, yeah, this is something what should be planned for the future. <laughs> All right. All right. So I think I have enough uh, white hair to be senior. Um, <laughs> if you're a senior faculty member, you have to go out and get it. So uh, I kind of learned and, and went to some workshops on FSL. Uh, I'm going to go to the software carpentry workshop that Ari's putting on because I think I need more programming skills. Um, yeah, that's, sorry, but I as think far as changing I, the culture, is that your question? And no, no. I'm asking who is making trainings, workshops, YouTube videos that are specifically designed for senior faculty? To the best of my knowledge, no one. Yeah. No one yeah. is contacting them. <laughs> That's right. Or yeah. oh, maybe they should contact the others. I mean, we should be really closing this session. I mean, I, I shouldn't start this, but there are actually some materials for the faculty. I mean, so there's a book at the helm by Kathy Barker, and I think Howard Hughes actually had some some book. I mean, so this is definitely being discussed in academia, not in the neuroinformatics context, but I mean, people are aware that. 
you know, we are essentially expected to be managers when we become PIs, right? And nobody is training us. I mean, we are being, I don't know, taught physics or mathematics, computer science, neuroscience, right? And then say, okay, now you're going to manage this lab. But I mean, this is. That, that's, a, that's a very good point, yes. This is. This is tricky. This is a very big point, and we should be keeping this. But I mean, I think this is a. You want to comment on that? Keep going. <laughs> uh, well, I just wanted to. I mean, because there's a poster session, and there's going to be a reception. And I guess everybody's waiting for that, so I wanted to close it. But I just give it over to Eva to do it. And you can comment, Bill. I mean, so Bill. You... No, I'll do it there. Okay, so. <laughs> so Bill is not commenting. <laughs> well, so if uh, if that. If that was supposed to be the end of that session, I, I thank you all of our guests and... Uh, <laughs>